Well, good evening, everybody. I don't have any chicken tonight, so we're going to just eat from the Word of God. One of these days I am, though. I am, certainly am. Um, if you would stand with me and let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to be with us tonight. Um, we need the mind of Christ. I need the mind of Christ. We also need the spirit of the Lord Jesus. Um, we need to be unified with him. And uh, by being unified with him, we can be unified with one another. Amen. It's hard for us to all unite around a common cause if it's somebody else's because we have opinions differing. But if we can all unite around the cause of Christ, it brings us together. And uh, we all have the same mind. And God can do amazing things when we're united. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you created us one in you. We are the body of Christ. You are the head. We need you this evening, God. We, we always need you. We desperately need the leading of the Spirit and the direction of Almighty God to, to help us, God, because left to ourself, we, we find ourselves in so many different ways directions and certainly disunified as we seek for our own way. But God, you came to this world so that your spirit could come and dwell within us and draw us close to you. And we as born again believers, spirit filled believers, have the opportunity to tap into the mind of Christ. And if we all tap into the mind of our Father, then we are all in one mind and one accord, and your will can be accomplished. Thank you, God, for this grace that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for the mercies that we walk in. I pray that you would be with us this evening. Let your, your words speak to our heart, and our hearts receive it. In Jesus' name, and everyone say amen. 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 Look at your neighbor and tell him you love him, and you're glad to be a part of the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Um, I know I have the mind of the Lord tonight because I certainly didn't want to go this direction. I had another, another direction that I was intending to go. I'm honestly becoming that guy that's got 100 books open. And I feel like I got 100 messages open. And the uh, cool thing is that God's going to draw all this. He, he's the thread, right? He's the, he's the common thread that brings all this together. And I'm leaving it up to him to sew this into a nice, neat package uh, because I'm certainly doing a horrible job if I, if I, have, if I have this sewing. Uh, I'm not a seamstress anyway. Um, I want to talk to you tonight about this, this subject. If you could just put it in your mind, dying for unity. Uh, how many times we say, man, I'm dying for a pizza, <laughs> right? <laughs> dying for some fried chicken. Uh, and, uh, but I want to talk to you about this subject, uh, maybe a double meaning, um, dying for unity. Uh, in the slang sense, I really hunger and thirst. I, I really, I'm dying for unity because I know what it brings. Right? We all know what unity brings. Uh, the psalmist <laughs> prophetically spoke about harvest in Psalms 133 when he said, how blessed it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity. He describes what it's like, and then at the end, he tells what it is. He, he says, well, it, it's like, it's like, and like, and then he gets right to the end, guys, and he goes, well, I can't describe it because the Holy Ghost wasn't given yet. He says, their place of unity is where God commands a blessing. And he tells what that blessing was because he, since he didn't know what salvation was yet, he said, life everlasting. And so I'm dying for unity because I my city... Our cities, our communities, our loved ones must 
come into the kingdom. Amen? How many of you got loved ones that you're dying to see saved? And then from our text, you'll understand the second meaning to this dying for unity. Um, John chapter 12, verse 23 through 27, Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? I, I, I am tricking you here, but uh, let's just be honest. The hour has come when the Son of Man should be glorified. That sounds pretty good, right? And it was. It was amazing. But his glorification, his view of glorification, in our view, totally different. Totally different. So the next verse, he, he's getting ready to be. He's getting ready to be crucified. John chapter 12, this is like the night before crucifixion or before the trial and crucifixion. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. He's talking about himself. The glorification was on the other side of the death. He had faith in the resurrection. He knew that if he could just get in the ground and die, there'd be a resurrection he would be glorified, and as a result, many would come to salvation. So he says the hours come when he's going to be glorified. Well, that glorification would bring men and women to salvation. I don't have time to go into the dissertation of how, remember whenever Mary came to him, he said, don't touch me. I've yet to send to my father. He was taking the blood of his sacrifice to take care of our sin. One last atonement service. One last atonement service where the Lamb of God would take away the sin of the world. Don't have time to go there. But he said, I'm going to be glorified. But before I'm glorified, before salvation can come, before the will of God can be accomplished, um, this corn of wheat has to fall on the ground and die. But if it'll die, it'll bring forth much fruit. Now the next verse. He that loves his life is not going to let it fall on the ground and die. <laughs> right? And my life is too important to me, and I, my, my views are too important, my dreams are too important. Um, <laughs> my life's too important, and I'm not going to let it fall on the ground and die. Are you kidding me? He said, well, um, you're going to lose it. But he that hates his life in this world, in other words, he that would give up the life in this world, benefits of this world. Notice what he said there. He that hateth his life where? When you're born again, you're born into a new kingdom. And if you and I can hate our life in this world, but love the life in the next world. When you and I can let go of the life in this world, conveniences, um, comfort, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life. That's what James said. It's a, or was it was he the one that said that? That's all that's in this world, lust of flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life. When you and I can let go of all these things that attain to this life, and we can fall in love with the next life, he said we're going to keep life unto life eternal. Next verse. If men serve me, let men follow me. Well, where are you going? Uh, I'm going to the cross. And then I'm going to a tomb. But if you can follow me from the cross to the tomb, you'll also follow me in resurrection and power and dominion. Anybody want to preach the rest of this message? I feel preach all over me right now. If any man serve me, let him follow me. Where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor.
I'm dying for unity. In five more chapters, this is the same night, same, same context, he starts praying, Father, let them be in me as I am in you. He's praying for unity in five chapters. He's, uh, chap- John chapter 17, he's praying that we would be in him the way he was in the Father and everything was about the Father, the Father's will. Next verse. Now is my soul troubled? What's troubled? Not what's trouble. What is troubled here? Help me out. His soul. What's, what's the soul? Seed of my emotions. My soul is troubled. My emotions are troubled. But my will, not my will, but thine be done. My emotions are troubled, but my will is undeterred. I'm going to do the will of God. Now is my soul troubled. You know what? You're going to have trouble in this life. Your soul's going to be troubled periodically in this life. Just because my soul's troubled, Brother Clousing, don't mean that I give up. I realize that in the will of God, sometimes my soul is troubled. My emotions sometimes are a wreck. But my will is not controlled by my emotions. Now, we know that up here. Uh, Brother Ralph, I don't know if he came up with it originally or he heard. It's probably Brother Arnold because he used to listen to Brother Arnold nonstop. He said, dead men don't feel anything. And we are crucified with Christ. I die. Jesus, Jesus didn't die on Calvary. I've heard this said before. He died in Gethsemane. When he said, not my will, thine be done. Can I tell you, the man Christ, Jesus didn't want to die. He said... Father, if it be possible, this is, this is his desire. You don't ask for something if it's not your desire, right? Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. There was the death. He died up here before the heart ever quit pumping. And it didn't matter what the body was going to go through. Let me tell you what. When you can die up here, when you can die in your mind to the flesh, it doesn't matter what happens to the flesh. I'm already dead to it. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. It was for this cause that I came to this hour. I'm going to ask you something. Why were you saved? Why was I saved? It was so that we would die to ourselves and be resurrected Him, right? So that His will could be accomplished in our life. Was it, James said, think it not a strange thing. At the fiery trial that would come upon you, don't, don't just scratch your head and say, oh my God, where did this come from? It's a part of the process of dying. Unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. Jesus realized the only way the church can be saved is if I fall on the ground and die. Well, we are his servants, he said, and so we follow him. Amen? And I can't die physically. Oh, I guess I could. Um, It's not my desire to die physically. I don't think I would benefit the kingdom of God. My wife would benefit so much better. My life insurance policy and and all my, all this, man, she'd just be, I tell her all the time, you'd be so much better off without me. Um, But 
the reality is our life as it's hid in Christ or as it's dead to the flesh becomes alive to Christ and alive for Christ. And so all the things that I used to be alive to desires let me just say lust and pride. And I don't mean all just sensual lust. Lust is desires. Desire for things that are not godly. We just put it there. Well, I don't know that because the Bible says uh, the spirit lust against flesh, flesh against spirit. So yeah, it would be just desires. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Those things die. Once those things are dead, Jesus said, the God of this world comes, and he can find nothing in me. In other words, anybody ever take a magnet and run it across uh, like gravel or something? And, you know, there's iron in a lot of uh, a lot of gravel and stuff and you just take a magnet and run across your, uh, your driveway if you got a gravel driveway and look at it all of a sudden there'll be like little rocks attached to that magnet that's iron ore it was attracted to that magnet Jesus said, the God of this world comes along, and he runs his magnet across my life, and there's absolutely nothing that's attracted to it. He can't find anything in me that's attracted to the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life. As a result, he can do the will of the Father because he's not distracted. He's not detracted by things that are within him. That's what it means when it says we got to fall into the ground and die. Because if we don't fall into the ground and die, then we're going to be distracted by things from this life. I can't necessarily do the complete will of God because it gets in the way of, and you just fill in the blank, that is, I'm attracted to in this life. Um, and I'm not here to, I'm not here to condemn or to uh, chastise anyone today. Uh, I do want to talk to us about dying for unity, unity of the purpose of God. Um, I, I want to share this to you in context. Um, I, I shared with you while I was in Botswana, the Lord reigniting and directing my, my, my passion and my, uh, my purpose and perhaps some of my calling for that country. And at the same time, I knew we were starting the campus in Pekin, and the Lord had put in my heart to open other campuses. And I said, God, how in the world am I going to have enough time and virtue to open more campuses and spend the time that I feel like you want me to spend in Botswana. How is this going to... I, I can't do that. I can't open these churches. And, and I, can't, uh, I can't maintain what's going on. Uh, open new churches. And minister in a foreign country. I, I don't have time to do what I'm doing now. And that's when the Lord spoke really plain to me and said, are you kidding me? How audacious. I thought I was the one that did the work. Got my attention quickly. And I felt like he impressed upon me that he gave me his vision. And as Paul said, I will give it. I will impart it unto other men. And through those men... God will fulfill his mission. And he said, and then you'll be free to do what I tell you to do, when I tell you to do it, and where I tell you to do it. That's the other side that I didn't tell you when I was explaining the, mission, the vision that God had given me, uh, the burden that he placed upon me. Uh, relax, I'm not going anywhere. I'll be mostly right here. This is my calling. My mother walked up to me after service. 
And um, she said, I, I need to tell you something if you receive it. <laughs> Hello? Number one, you're my mother. Number two, you are the mother. What do you have to say? She said, when I came back from California, she said the first service was uh, Bible quizzing. It was young people, a lot, of, a lot of young people, a lot of young children. And she said, I turned and looked at, at your dad and said, James, who are those? Who are those children? She, I, I don't know who those children are. Now, understand, they've been gone for almost seven years. And he just looked at me and smiled and he said, that's the church, hon. He said, she said, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, you fell in the ground and died. And this is what was brought forth. She said, I hadn't thought of that again until you began to talk tonight. And she said, after you were finished telling what was on your heart, she said, the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, I need, to tell, I need you to tell him you have fallen into the ground and died. Just crazy, kind of ties into what Pastor Upworth, I uh, can't think of that. Tom Eckhart told me, I need a dead man. He fallen into the ground and died. And these ministry you pour into them, and these men will do the ministry that God has for this area. Okay, that's a challenge. That's different. That is <laughs> got to be God because it's not me or us, but it's important for end-time revival. In order for that to happen, we all have to come together to a place of death, of self. I'm not Jim Jones. You're not drinking any Kool-Aid tonight. We're not passing out any snakes. Um, but we all have to come to a place of emotional and personal death to ourselves so we can come alive to the purpose of God within us. Now, that sounds really good in theory, but what does it look like in practice well, I'm going to read you what the Holy Ghost, I, I always pray in, and um, I just started writing, and about halfway through my writing in my prayer journal, I realized, okay, you're writing what the Lord wants to speak tonight, so I tried to quit because I didn't like the direction it was going, and um, I couldn't, and so I'm just going to talk to you the way the Lord talked to me about us. Is that okay with you? Um, first of all, everything that we do, we do for the kingdom and not for individual. And as Paul said, I don't magnify myself. I magnify the office of a pastor. To be honest with you, I would rather somebody else have this job. It's not negative, okay? So relax. I can see some of you fastening your seatbelts. Relax. It's just where we are and where we're going and how we got to, what things we have to do to get where we're going and to be aware of the fact that the enemy is terrified because of where this church is going and what is happening. It's okay if he can confine us to a small little place in the south end of Peoria. But we start talking about branching out, starting starting an apostolic, one God, apostolic work in a community where there is none and has over 75,000 people in their own metro area, now then you're stepping out of your comfort zone and you're stepping on the battlefield, so to speak. As long as you can contain us where we are, okay. But he can't. And once we step out, you step you just stepped into a battle. And I don't know if you realize it or not, but <laughs> when we proclaimed, we threw our spear like they used to do back in the day across the, uh, across the, uh, the border, into the, bo into the land of another, uh, another nation. That was a declaration of war. Well, we 
cast the spear. And I've done it several times in years gone by. Every single time I have suffered in my body. Every time I've tried to open this campus, something has happened. COVID, I've had COVID now so many times. I think every time a new one comes out, I, I can't wait to get it. I, I don't know what's going on. They said after you had it, you know, you develop immunities. I think mine's like a magnet. Any, whoo, whoo, any, any COVID out there? I'm not, I'm not speaking that on myself. That was unjust. Um, but that emotional attack, relational uh, uh, issues that was worse than any physical ailment that I faced, of course, you know the cancer and the chemo. <laughs> How many of you realize that I went, to, you know when I went to Africa, right, and I came home and went through cancer and chemo? How many of you know that I was furious because I intended to start um, peaking the week or two weeks before I left, but I felt, you know, it's just not right for me to do that and be gone and come back? You're not the only ones that knew that. So, we're starting peaking back up. I'm healthy as a horse right now, as far as I know. But I am stomping out fires. If he can't distract us one way, he'll distract us another way. You see, he can't attack us from without because the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. He can't attack us from without. So he has to do it from within. The only way Satan could get to, to Jesus was not from the Sadducees or the Pharisees. He had to find Peter in a weak moment. What did he say? For this cause came I into the world. If you read the next one, Peter goes, Oh, no, not so, Lord. What happened? The enemy found a weakness in Peter. and Jesus had to say, Satan, get behind me. You are an offense to me. You savor not the things of God. Right now, Peter, you're all consumed with yourself. So, um, we're getting ready to start this campus up in, in a couple of weeks. I want to tell you, for the last three months, the enemy has done everything he can to distract us. Because who's the church? It's not this building. It's not the building in Pekin. We are the church. The only thing that can hinder the church is for the church to be divided, to be distracted, to become alive to ourself. And the enemy knows our weaknesses. He knows what we tend to be alive to. See, Pastor, well, you haven't called me in the office yet. Yet. Please, I'm begging you, don't make me. I've got too many things going on. You're not, I'm not chastising anybody. I'm trying to reveal the attack of the enemy upon the church and upon the progress. We're amazing people, but you've got to get amazing people in the right place. And the right place is not opposing uh, one another. And I, I'm not, I'm, again, I'm not trying to say there's some bad people in here that are opposed to what's going on. No, I'm saying there are brothers and sisters in here who the enemy's doing everything he can. All of us, all of us, he's trying to do everything he can to find a weakness in us that would cause us to be Otherwise than unified in mind, soul, spirit, purpose, calling. And that, Pastor, I'm behind you to build the church. You can't tell me you're behind me to build the church if we're creating issues. Mom has to be healthy before she can have a baby. Okay? Um, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to crack the whip over anybody. I'm trying to get every one of us to go home 
and to self-analyze ourself, our homes, our motives, and ask ourselves, are, is what we're engaged in, what we're doing, is it breeding unity or disunity? And when I disengage from anything, I've just created a vacuum. And we feel it from the top down. Don't allow the enemy to get in your head and get you distracted over anything. A new job. A new relationship. A sickness. An offense. A weakness. Don't allow the enemy to get in your head and to distract you. So laboring to enter into his rest is a fight against not only hell, but against ourselves as well. Now I'm just going to read, okay? Because I, I, I feel like I need to get this done. i got about 12 minutes to do it. You and I must be united to fulfill the will of God. Everybody remember this Tower of Babel? The Lord said, the people are of one mind. They're going to accomplish whatever. What could we accomplish if we were of one mind? You see, the enemy knows that too, and it terrifies him. And that's why, Brother Duhan, you're not perfect. And if the enemy can get me to focus on your imperfection, I will fail to see the benefits that you have for the kingdom. Guess what? I'm not perfect either. You're not perfect. Neither are you perfect. Neither are you perfect. Not a one of us are perfect here. So if the enemy can get us to focus on one another's imperfections, he found a chink in the armor. But if you and I would see, you know what? <laughs> they may not be the strongest in that aspect, but neither am I. But man, look at what they can do in this, in this realm. And they're benefiting the kingdom. Now, if I can... If, if, the Scripture talks about us devouring one another. And sometimes we don't even mean to. A word. Be careful of the words that you speak, even if it's not to that individual, because the enemy will make sure that spoken word finds its way, because that individual's going to tell something. I told them not to tell. Well, they can't wait to tell. There's only two types of secrets. Those that are not good enough to keep, and those that ain't worth, or those that are not, uh, what, those that are not worth keeping, and those that are too good to keep. So be careful what the, remember, the prophecy of your praise. So begin to prophesy good things about those people. It, it's really hard to, it's really hard to, um, it's really hard to talk bad about somebody that you're praising. <laughs> We must be unified to fulfill the will of God. An army has to be disciplined to endure individual hardship to win a battle collectively. Grandpa Braggs wasn't a real strong physical person. But he, he was so literal. You tell him what to do, and he's going to kill himself getting it done. He could follow orders. You know, that kept him alive, well, along with the Lord, during the Korean conflict. When the enemy would come in so quick, he was a BAR operator, a Browning Automatic Rifle Gunner. Didn't think he could live for God because he'd killed so many men. The fact that his... His officer, commanding officer, told him, Braggs, you stay there and you hold your position no matter what. If it kills you, you hold your position. Now, if he would have been conscientious of his own well-being, when the, he says the Chinese, he said it wasn't the North Koreans, it was the Chinese. They've been trying to get us well before that virus. Anyway, he said, if... if um, <laughs> Some of you didn't like that. Unity, unity, unity. He said sometimes they, when the wave of attack would break, he's not here, so he's passed on to glory, so I can talk about this. He said they were so close that I would go out and I would gather the dead bodies and place them around me as a barricade because the ground was too hard for me to dig any deeper. 
is up on the mountains in the frozen tundra. Everything to be for human preservation would say, run, forest, run. But because he was disciplined as a soldier to endure individual hardship, their, their position was never overrun. There are going to be times when it looks like all hell has their guns trained on you and everything is going wrong. And individually, you and I have to be spiritually disciplined to hold fast to the cause, to the purpose. Otherwise, we'll just capitulate and say, you know what, it's too much. No, let me tell you something. With Job, yea, though he slays me. If I'm going to die, brothers and sisters, in this thing, I'm going to die trying to do what's right. I'm going to die in the cause. We have too many brothers and sisters from Nero and that Roman Empire that died in the faith. Hebrews 8, sawn asunder. Ugh. Where was God in that? We, we, got, we got to go. Anyway, I got to go. got to go. We have to endure hardship, but we have to be spiritually disciplined because things aren't always going to go our way. And it's for the good of the kingdom. Christ died. That's not good for him, right? It's great for us. Sometimes in the kingdom, you're going to take a hit. Can you take one for the team? Oh, come on. We don't war for our own convenience or our own comfort. We war for the furthering of the gospel. How much conflict could be avoided and virtue spent correctly fighting the enemy if we weren't so consumed with making our world comfortable? And everything right for us. When you're on the front lines, you can sleep in a cold, muddy, dirty foxhole with people trying to kill you. That's the job. At home, there can't be a pee under 20 mattresses or we're bruised and broken all to pieces. You show me a person a believer who's interceding and mentoring and consumed with the kingdom. And I'll show you a God-focused individual who's causing no disunity. Is everything right? <laughs> no, we're in a war. Don't give me K-rations. I'd rather go to steakhouse. But if I'm on the front lines, I'm hungry. Give me some k -ration. Give me something. We cannot be too comfortable. We are in a war. It's time to shed ourselves from the comforts of yesterday and embrace the battle of today so we can have victory tomorrow. The enemy looks to create a spirit of diversion and, and, and division through, hear me, these are what come to my mind, accusation. He is the accuser of the brethren. Remember that. And so when you start speaking accusation, what, let me just say, when I start speaking accusation, I'm becoming the enemy's mouthpiece. If Jesus could rebuke Peter and refer to him because he, had the, he was doing the, the, uh, the work of Satan, and say, get thee behind me, Satan. He wasn't talking to Peter. He was talking to the spirit that was motivating that, that vocabulary. When I begin to accuse a brother or sister, I'm doing the work of the enemy. So the enemy is the accusation. He's the accuser of the brethren. And so he, he endeavors to be careful what you say. Remember, Prophesy blessing, prophesy praise. Casting doubt. Mm, I don't know about that. Can I just break in here as pastor? I don't mind people 
approaching me with an idea, with a concept. I, I try to be approachable, but I'm also responsible. There are two men who can speak to me and say, do this. Bishop Lashley, Bishop Ellis. You don't want everybody that comes in my office or catches me off to the side and says, I have a word from God. You don't want them changing my mind. Now, I am approachable. If you approach me and say, you know what, da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and you've got some things to back it up, don't expect me to say, okay, I'll, I'll, you know what, you're absolutely right. No, I'm going to take that, and I'm going to go run it off of my filter. First, I'm going to run it through the Word and the Holy Ghost, and if I don't get an okay on that, I'm going to go to Bishop Lashley. I'm going to go to Bishop Ellis. I may go to, uh, I, I may go to Prophet Shelton, and trust me, you would rather God Bishop Ellis or Bishop Lashley, give me a word before Prophet Shelton. There's something about these prophets, you know. They call bears out of the woods, fire out of heaven, all kinds of weird stuff. Anyway, I just say that to say we're not going to be divided. Don't allow the enemy to get in your head with some doubt. If you've got a problem with me, go to Bishop. Lashley or Ellis, I don't care. Whatever those two men tell me to do is what I'm going to do. They're the only two other, other two men beside God that could say, you know what, you need to step down. I'd say, yes, sir. We need those accountabilities in our life. I need those accountabilities in my life. But understand that there is an order of authority. So, don't allow the enemy to get in your head and cast doubt, offense, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, desire, jealousy, or pride. Because a house divided against itself cannot stand. And this is the house of God. This is the work of God. We cannot allow the enemy to divide us. Amen? Amen? Something's bigger at stake here than just our opinions, our comfort. We only attain the eternal blessing of God, the harvest, life evermore, through unity. We are invading enemy territory right now in North Pekin, and we will only succeed as this church is unified. I'm not talking about that church because that church is being born out of this church. And I'm not just talking about the work. Oh, Pastor, I'm behind the work in Pekin. But that I, I really love the word but when it comes from God, but it gets us in trouble when it comes from himself. The enemy knows this, and he's looking for a way to hinder. No better way of derailing an attack than to get the enemy questioning, distracted, or fighting amongst themselves. Pastor, is the church really that bad? No, I'm trying to head some things off the pass. You know, the Old Testament dealt with actions. The New Testament dealt with spirits. Go read uh, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. It said, uh, you talk about murder, I talk about anger. It's a spirit of murder. Now, I find myself stretched to the limits. I'm just going to tell you this. Trying to keep peace in a normally loving, forgiving, and inclusive body of Christ. I told my wife, I said, there's a problem when I'm more anxious and stressed about a church that's already going than the one I'm getting ready to start. Pastor, is the church a mess? No. But if we don't take care of some of these things and we let the enemy have his way, it will be. I'd rather stomp down a molehill in my yard than wait on the mountain to be deposited there. When somebody say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And one Wednesday night, me talking to um, 
all of these that are here and all of you that are listening to me is a whole lot better than one at a time in my office. I don't have time, energy, strength, aptitude, desire. Let me just say it. I ain't going to do it. I don't have time for that. I know where this comes from. I know where this invasion comes from. It's not human. It's not you. It's not me. However, the enemy is using our humanity, and we all have them, to infiltrate our thoughts about one another or ministry or the work ahead. Don't allow it. Do not allow it. I'm not just speaking to you. One of the greatest spirits that I'm fighting against lately is defensiveness. We have nothing to defend ourselves from one another. No reason to defend ourselves from one another. Don't let the enemy get in your head and tell you so-and-so is against you. No, we're for one another, right? If you've got something against a brother or sister, you are bound in the Word of God. Go fix it. Don't talk about them. Don't be angry at them until it explodes. Go fix it. You let it fester, and nobody's going to be able to touch you. Go fix it. Well, I, I, I don't know if they'll receive me. Then that's pride on your part. This is worth... There is something bigger at stake here. Oh, Jesus. And I'm late. Tough. I got to get through this. Um, I shouldn't say that. I didn't mean tough. I, I'm sorry. I got to get through this. Um, I tend to be defensive when things pop up because I love the church. Jesus. I told a pastor's wife the other day, she said, well, how do you deal with this kind of situation? I said, the problem is, first, we've got to deal with ourselves because we tend to be defensive as ministers. And here's why. We are not God manifest in flesh. I don't have all wisdom and knowledge. He stepped out in confidence. I step out in faith. But I want you to know that my heart is for truth. I will do anything for truth. Now, it's got to be in love. I'll confront you if I need to. It'll be in love. Would you please receive it in love? If a brother or sister comes, they're coming to you looking for truth, wanting truth to be established. I pray that you approach somebody in the spirit of love, not in a you did me wrong, in a how can we fix this? Unity is more important than me having my way or my say. Um, I promise you I'll hurry. I have nothing to defend myself from. So if you come to me and you're barking and you see my hackles rise, I'm just saying, uh, if you go to Brother Grant and you go with an attitude and you see that first, or Brother Lashley or Drew or any, any of us, and you go to a brother or sister and you see this, realize that... Ask yourself, do they feel attacked? Are they being defensive? Are they mad at me or are they trying to defend themselves? That's going to determine the unity level. You can have your say, and it may be right, but if it's not in love, you're wrong. Likewise, myself. Okay? Realize what's happening. Fight against the spirit of, divi- of disunity through humility. Really? Humility? In honor, preferring one another? That's not my words. That's, that's Scripture. Go to a brother. They always say, take the low road or the high road. I, I, I don't know which one it is, but take the humble road. Don't. You did this. Why am I getting off on this? It appears to me, it seems to me, I may be wrong.
Could you be wrong? No, there is no way. I know. No, you don't. And you are really setting yourself up to be the offender, not the offended. So go humbly. With, pri- with having uh, prioritized what's important. I remember Brother Lashley used to say, what do I want out of this conversation? You want to have your say or you want unity? We want the will of God, right? And important, spiritual discipline. You better pray through before you have that conversation. There are more important matters at hand than just our individual issues. For There's 400,000 plus people at stake. So often we think of our situation, it's justified because of principles that we misapply. Now, some of you are sitting here, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this, and you're, you're shoveling all this over your shoulder. Would everybody just open your mouth for a second? Hold your breath in case you had garlic, but... No, what I'm saying is for you. Not for your neighbor, not for, in, for us. I've already eaten out of this bowl. I've already prayed, put my nose in the carpet. I, I've, I've already been through this. This is the only way I can say what I'm saying to you. So often we think our situation is justified. Yeah, but remember, our yabbits put us in a pit and in, in, in a tunnel, a maze that we can't get out of. You start self-justifying, you'll never stop. Principles misapplied. They should not have done this to me. Probably not. They shouldn't have crucified God. But aren't you glad that they did? Peter, that's not going to happen to you. Yeah, it is. You don't understand why this is happening. Maybe you don't understand why you're suffering. Maybe there's some greater good that's going to come out of your suffering. Are you able to take an offense so that Christ can be magnified? Remember, Touch not my anointed. Do my prophets no harm. I'm sure these things were going on in Peter's head. This is right. I'm going to defend the Messiah. No, it was misapplied truth. Peter, you're an offense because you can only see your small world. The kingdom is bigger than you and I. Amen? Rather than reacting naturally... I wonder what would happen if we would fast and pray as much as we stewed and complained. If there's a situation you're dealing with, and I know some of you are, you don't know that I know that I, that I know. I wonder if you hadn't reacted and you would have fasted and prayed about that situation if God hadn't brought peace to that situation before you reacted and made a buffoon of yourself. Is that too plain? Bella said it was not. I really make a mess out of things and a bigger problem, Brother Grant, that I got to go back and fix because I reacted. You live in a natural world, right? Natural events happen. And you know what? I am flesh and blood, and there's times I'm going to act naturally, Brother Jeremy. So you can stop the crazy cycle. Just because I act naturally don't mean you have to. Somebody's got to stop this mess. <laughs> I saw a meme the other day. It said, walk away. I am not the bigger person. <laughs> Somebody's got to be. Amen? So natural things happen. The only way we can stop the crazy cycle is for you and I to act supernaturally. Well, it's just not in me. Balarky. You are partakers of a Oh, of a divine nature. The old Olivia isn't present and the new Olivia is she. Then the new Olivia doesn't act the way old Olivia did. Old Olivia was natural. 
So when pastor does something and slips into his edemic mode, you better not slip into Olivia's mode or this thing's going to spiral out of control. Jesus, help me. Is this the second week I've kept you over? Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying or do you need to stop and we'll come back and do this later? Okay, I just got a little bit more. If we want to reap spiritually, we've got to sow spiritually into a natural world, into natural circumstances. Somebody's going to do something stupid. I promise you, tomorrow, the enemy is going to test you whether you've heard this or not. You're going to be done wrong. You're going to be done naturally. (laughs) You choose whether you want to act spiritually or react naturally. And the only way we can do that is to be progressive, get spiritual, stay spiritual, because you don't know when the natural is going to happen. Be proactive so that you won't be reactive. Be spiritually minded so you don't react carnally or naturally. How much virtue and unity could be preserved by reacting in fasting and prayer Rather than, that's not right. Well, duh. You don't live in a perfect world. But you can make it right. Not by conforming them to your ideal. I wonder what would happen if I'd go to fasting and prayer. Brother Duhan, maybe you'd hear the mind of God. You'd fix your crazy self. No, Sister Duhon, I am not going on a fasting spree. I wonder what would happen if we wouldn't allow the enemy to get in our head. I wonder how much virtue could be spent in intercession for upcoming events and services and and churches and and the lost and, and people if we weren't so consumed with reacting. First of all, if we would begin to fast and pray, God would put our spirit back into control, and these things would work themselves out. Because I promise you, although you did me wrong, I know your heart is right. You want to be right towards God. And if I'll get right in my spirit, and I'll pray for the unity between the two of us, eventually, because I know that you love God, God's going to begin to talk to you, and you're going to say, you know what? Jeffrey, that, that wasn't right. I just want to be unified. I, I just want to be, I, I want to be in unity with my brother. Can we fix this? How did that happen? It wasn't because I convinced him I was right. It's because I, I love my brother. I love the spirit of unity. And I went to my knees in prayer and I began to beseech the throne of God that unity would happen. You know, God didn't straighten Peter, James, and John up. Did tell him, uh, you don't know what spirit you're of. <laughs> but he didn't tell him, you're not seeing this right. He didn't jump down their throat. What did he do? He goes to John chapter 17, says, I know this is a tough time. I know that there is, there's pressure on the church right now. I know they realize they may not know everything, but they realize there's some things that are going on. They may not realize that I'm getting ready to go to Calvary in a few hours, but Father, unify us. God, somehow, bring us together in unity. He didn't berate them because they wasn't seeing it his way. Do you know how frustrated God must have been to spend three and a half years with these jerks and they still can't get it right? I'm getting ready to die. I'm getting ready to put it in their hands and they still can't get it right? Come on, he was human. But instead of reacting, he begins to do the only thing that works. He goes to his knees in prayer, and God changes the heart of those disciples. Oh, Jesus, what would happen if we could go to a, our knees in prayer? And what, what would God do that our words could never do? Okay. Last statement. Don't react in a manner. Think it not strange, the fiery trial? 
Well, if we don't think it's strange, then don't react in a manner that's strange to the Holy Ghost within us when these things happen. And this can only happen if we're full of the Holy Ghost. When things are easy and everything's going good, we don't generally stay full of the Holy Ghost. We stay close. I tell my daughters, don't ever let your car get below quarter tank, especially in the wintertime. I prefer a half a tank in the wintertime. But you know what? Invariably, come summer, it's not going to be cold. I could walk. And I get in my wife's car, and I got to go by Casey's before I could make it to Kroger's. We know what we need to do, but in times of convenience, eh, is it really that important? Listen, we've been in times of comfort. God's been good to us. We, we've, we've maintained. We've been really good. But listen, we're in war right now. Some things have changed. You've got to keep your tank full because you don't know when you're going to hit a slick spot. You don't know when a situation, the enemy's going to catch you in a bad situation. I said this last night in uh, Bible study. I know how to get to St. Louis, and I may have a reason to get to St. Louis. But if I don't fill that V8 up with fuel before I leave my house as much as I want to, as much as my purpose demands it, as much as, as I know how to get there, it's not going to do me any good without fuel in the tank. We can know what we're supposed to do. We can know how to do it. We can know why we're to do it. But if we don't stay full of the Holy Ghost, somewhere between here and St. Louis, we're going to be sitting on the side of the road. Jesus told Peter, the Spirit is willing, but the we dare not live by the flesh. I, I, I'm taking all this time, and I'm sorry I've taken 15 minutes, 18 minutes extra of your time tonight. We dare not allow the enemy to infiltrate our spirit and hinder the future. The only way we can do this is to stay full of the Holy Ghost. Two dogs, equal strength, same DNA. Same aptitude, get in a fight. Which one's going to win? The one you fed the most. You got two natures that struggle within you. You know who's going to win this fight? The one we feed the most. Stand with me. There is a cause, and every one of us are called to it. And you can do it. It's in you. I don't care what the enemy says to your mind. I don't care what your weaknesses say. You can do this. You were called to do this. Don't let the enemy get in your head. Distract you. God is for you. We're going to do this. We are going to be victorious. We are victorious. But you and I individually are going to be victorious. This church is going to go. This church is going to grow. And there will be multiple campuses, and you're going to be a part of ministering in them. Don't let the enemy distract you. God needs you. I need you. Our metro is depending on you. Thank you, God, for your hope. Thank you, God, for your grace. It is sufficient. Now let your will be done in us, through us, by us. Be glorified in your church, I pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. I love you. With all my heart, I love you. I pray for you. And I don't like talking like this, but sometimes, as Miranda says, I just had to. I love you. God bless you. You're dismissed.